Hello, BookTube. I uh, went to the Brattle Bookshop this morning. <laughs> I had I had other errands to run, including a long delayed trip to the post office. Uh, one of many that I'm going to have to do because I've got books packed up like crazy. Uh, I haven't wanted to do it. I have wanted to do it, but I haven't done it because it's felt like a, just an egregious risk to go to a post office in the middle of a, of a raging pandemic. Uh, and I, I mentioned that I went to a post office that I know really well. I know the clerks there really well. They are right there. They have been on the job the whole time. They haven't closed down. And, uh, the postal clerk that I was talking to, uh, has the full visor on a plastic screen in front of her. She has a tray that she slides out for everything that you want. So you never hand her anything. She never hands you anything. And, uh, when I mentioned that, she said, ah, don't be such a baby. We wipe down everything. She showed me her bottle of disinfectant. She said, we wipe down everything every hour. We take more precautions here than you take at home. And she was right. <laughs> She's absolutely right. She's still at work. She's in the public all day long, every day. She's still at work. She hasn't been infected. They're taking common sense precautions. I am as safe there as I am at home. So I, I wanted to do that. I didn't know that I was going to get a dressing down, but it was well-deserved. And we laughed about it. Uh, and that post office, the one that I went to, is right around the corner from the Brattle Bookshop. So I went to the Brattle Bookshop, and I've got a bunch of books to show you that I hope will be keepers. I hope all of them will be keepers. Uh, for those of you who are new to the channel, obviously, since I am working on... I, 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 since every day I look at the 8K Q&A video that I made and see questions filling it up, obviously, since we're at 8K, uh, there are new people to this channel. So you might not know what I'm talking about. The Brattle is a used bookshop. In the heart of downtown Boston, they're very old and they're very, very good. Oh, my. They have a third floor that's sort of the rare and antique stuff behind glass or in higher price points. But the first and second floor are just crammed with normal used bookstore books at reasonable prices. Just double stuffed, double stacked on the shelves. Just fantastic. And on top of all that, uh, there's a sale lot right next door. The whole the, the lot that would otherwise be the foundation for another building is full of Brattle sale carts, sale shelves of $1, $3, and $5 books, thousands more of them out there, in no order whatsoever except group by price. So you have to just grope around. If you've got an hour to waste, you could. Or if you're a bookish person, there's no better way that you could spend it than brow just idly browsing those Brattle carts, provided the weather is nice. And the weather was fairly nice today. Uh, my old friend Deb and I have been to those carts when it was snowing outside. Snow was just collecting on us like bison in Yellowstone National Park. I've been out there. We've been there in bitter, bitter cold. When, as I always used to tell them, we're going to go and freeze our giblets off. <laughs> or we've also been there in boiling hot heat. Uh, but on in fairly nice weather, oh my, I could lose myself. Because it's these are all my old friends. These books are all my old friends. I've known them sold them, handled them in their tens of thousands for so long. Uh, and the goal is always to find keepers, whether you're paying a dollar or three dollars or five dollars or twenty dollars. The goal is always to find keepers, is to find a book that will come in this room and that I will never get rid of. But I don't adhere strictly to that goal because if you're paying a dollar for a book, you don't need it to be a, a forever find. A dollar is a fine price to pay for an experiment. Something that you that you haven't read, that you don't know anything about. I don't often do that. I have such an enormous history with books that often, most of the time, my shopping at the Brattle is for things that I want to reread or things that I see that I want to own, things like that. But I do. I do experiment from time to time. Uh, and I want to show you uh, the results of today. And the first one I'll show you is an experiment. I've never read this book. This is a little murder mystery. It's a little historical murder mystery by P.C. Doherty called The Death of a King. And it's a historical murder mystery in which a uh, character is conscripted to find out the truth of the murder of Edward II. Uh, and, uh, well, let me, let me read it to you here. The horrifying murder takes place. The murder of a king. The crime remains shrouded in secrecy for years until a wily royal clerk named Edward Beck is ordered to investigate. Where he journeys, who he encounters, and what he discovers is a rich and thrilling tale of intrigue. It is a tale that takes you to Berkeley Castle in the year 1344, to the court of King Edward III, and into the desperate mind of Edward Beck. Who conspired to kill King Edward II? Why did the dead king's son wait 17 years to look into the case? Why does the dreadful Queen Isabella keep her late husband's bloody heart encased in glass? 
<laughs> Why was Beck, of all people, chosen to uncover these ugly secrets? I'm all for it. Absolutely. I saw this and thought, yeah, absolutely. I, I That's fantastic. I love, uh, you know, little paperback murder mysteries anyway. And a while ago, a year ago, the Brattle got a huge... They went on a buy and brought back boxes and boxes and boxes of little mass market paperback murder mysteries. I've tried to control myself, but every once in a while I pick up a couple more. Now, I admit, mostly, my drift when buying those little paperback murder mysteries has been towards English village murder mysteries in the 20th, written in the 20th century, but usually set in the very early 20th century, including ideally between the two wars. I'm finding a sweet spot for that. I hate to admit it because W.H. Auden had that same sweet spot and I don't like to give him any, any any ground at all. You give him an inch, he'll take a mile. But nevertheless, that's usually what I get. But, and this is obviously much earlier, but I'll take it. Absolutely. Uh, uh, historical fiction about King Edward II. Absolutely. Uh, then this next one is something we've seen on this channel before in a couple of different formats. I admit it's the format that I got this time because I have a sweet spot for these. So when I see them, I tend to get them. These are little Bantam classics from uh, 30, 40 years ago. Uh, this is David Copperfield. I got a little David Copperfield, which I put. I have a shelf right up there uh, that is only these little Bantam classics of a particular type and a particular time period. I can, I can spot them in a minute, but I don't know what distinguishes them, except that what I'm probably talking about here is a particular cover design. It, probably if I were to dig into the history of Bantam Double Day Dell, I would be able to figure out that it was a particular company that designed the covers and the, the books, the look of these things, and that that's what I'm, that I'm responding to that didn't exist before that company was hired and, and changed once they left. But one way or another, I'll add David Copperfield to that list. Uh, then we have a debut novel, tremendously effective thing. I've read it uh, twice now. I read it when it first came out. I read it, I reread it. Uh, but I, it was a dollar. I'm perfectly willing to give it another try. This is Paul Watkins, and this is Night Over Day Overnight. Uh, another historical novel, this time about a, a, a rowdy and discontented teenage boy uh, who decides in the waning years, he's a German, and he decides in the waning years of World War II that for the hell of it, or just to spice up his life, he will join the Wehrmacht <laughs> when the war is clearly over, unless you are one of the tiny handful of the German population that actually believed the Nazi Ministry of Propaganda saying that they were winning on the front. Of course, you've cut off all communication with the outside world, so most of the people who hear that kind of mythology might be tempted to believe it. They certainly might not have anything to contradict it. There were plenty of Germans who knew, though. Word was smuggled into the country in plenty of different ways to let, to let ordinary Germans know that there is no future in the Nazi armed services, that the, that the Allies are closing in on literally all sides. Uh, but what a, what a bleak and powerful novel this is, and so eloquent, and also a tremendously convincing portrait of, a, of the, the mind and the worldview of, of a confused teenage boy, not that there's any other kind. And uh, when you're reading this, I, I look forward to reading it again before the end of the year, but when you, well, the first time I was reading it, I didn't know anything about it. I got it in an unmarked galley. And I was reading it and I was thinking, you know, I've never read, well, this is a fantastic war novel on top of everything else. It reminds me a lot, and the way that it deals with war, it reminds me a lot of Birdie by William Wharton, another novelist who is now forgotten. And Birdie is a terrific war novel. Boy, oh boy. And this reminds me of that in a lot of ways. Uh, but when I was reading it for the first time, I was thinking, boy, this rings true. It really does. The, the main character especially rings true. And it was only later that I discovered that Paul Watkins wrote this when he himself was a teenage boy. <laughs> so, when he was like 16 or 17. So it, maybe it makes sense. <laughs> but, but I've gone on to, uh, to read a lot of his other novels, maybe all of them, and... They're all really, really good, but this debut is standout. I, I saw it, and it was dirt cheap, cheap enough to grab, so I did. Same thing with this next one. I've read this many times, uh, but uh, reading it again uh, this year, I'm not 100% sure how that will work. Um, I could love it, or it could be so painful that I just can't even continue reading it, uh, which is why I haven't reinforced it or fixed it up at all. This is Theodore White, and this is The Making the President, 1960. It's Kennedy versus Nixon. Uh, and this was a very, very close on race so that there were allegations that the Kennedys stole the race. There were, those allegations lingered for decades. Uh, 
White is fantastic. And he was embedded is the word we would use today. He's fantastic at bringing out personalities in these people. I just don't know if this is just going to be too painful to read. I, I, when I was in the Brattle sale lot, I noticed one particular passage here. Uh, that'll give you a flavor of what this whole thing is like. Uh, in the hard life of politics, it is well known that no platform or any program advanced by either major American party has any purpose beyond expressing emotion. Platforms are a ritual with a history of their own, and after being written, they are useful chiefly to scholars who dissect them as archaeological political remains. The writing of a platform does indeed flatter many people, gives many pressure groups a chance to blow off steam in public, permits the leaders of such pressure groups to report back to their membership of their valiant efforts to persuade. But in actual fact, all platforms are meaningless. The program of either party is what lies in the vision and conscience of the candidate the party chooses to lead it. I read that and had a wormwood taste in my mouth, because of course at the, at the 2020 Republican National Convention the, the Republican Party let it be known that they did not have a platform. And that led commentators left and right all over the news media to say Donald Trump is the platform. And a lot of them sounded scandalized by that, and I was too. They could, they could at least have gone through the kabuki theater of it. But I did at the time vaguely remember White writing that, that, that the platform is the candidate either way, no matter what the candidate is. So I don't know. I will give this a try. It's, it, I loved it when I first read it, but it may be too much to do now. Uh, then this next one, I know that I will like. <laughs> this author has written, writ, wrote so many books about books. This book stands a good chance of coming into this room. This is by Lawrence Clark Powell, and it is Bookman's Progress, a series of speeches, essays, and, and uh, addresses that he gave on all kinds of bookish subjects, but especially libraries, because he was a fervent advocate of libraries. He was the uh, uh, chief librarian, or the head of the library science school at the University of California at uh, Los Angeles, I think. Uh, he, and he was, he was an academic and a professional librarian for his whole career, having been saved, uh, as he puts it, because he had a whole bunch of skills and a degree in a totally a, a other field when a passionate librarian a, a woman approached him and made her pitch that libraries need you that the world of libraries needs you needs people like you so he took an enormous chance he put all of the directions of his life on hold uh, raised a little money that he really didn't have and went and got a library science degree and event it eventually became uh a working librarian, an antiquarian specialist, a head librarian, library director, all that sort of thing, and wrote the whole time. Really good essays. There's one, there's one in particular in here that I, I couldn't help but laugh when I when I glanced at the table of contents because I've seen this book before. It was on the shelf at a library that I used to they used to go to all the time. I don't think I ever read the whole of it, but there's one essay in here that I did read called "What's Wrong with Librarians?" <laughs> a question that I've been asking my whole life. <laughs> And that essay, if I remember correctly, is really, really good, where where uh, Powell writes that, as far as he's concerned, the two qualities that every librarian should have are bookishness and amiability. The, the, the idea that a librarian is, is uh, you know, ma mainly interested in dusting and keeping things quiet, or a disciplinarian mainly interested in cracking down on the rules, is antithetical to the true work of a librarian. And he... he not only saw that, but promulgated that. In every big and little library where he was asked to give an address or a speech, many of which are included in this book, he advocated that kind of a librarian, that you're not sitting behind a desk stamping things and telling people to be quiet. You're greeting them at the door. If you're a small library, you're saying, what are you interested in? Can I help you? I, this is my library. I know, it, I know it inside and out. Let me help put it to work for you. That, that sort of thing. A much simpler, more straightforward thing. That attitude owes as much to Clark or to Powell as it does to anybody. Um, and there were a lot of writers that 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 were felt themselves very grateful to L.C. Powell uh, for his advocacy of this great institution. So these these are going to be great. There's going to be a lot in here that I haven't read. Uh, so that's wonderful. Uh, then this next one, this next one, this next one I haven't. I haven't read in forever. It also was on the shelf of that library that I'm talking about. And I did pull it down and read it when I should have been researching something else. 
And it's a figure, believe it or not, <laughs> only on this channel. It's a figure who's come up before a few times. <laughs> this is Viscount Grey. Grey of Falloden is how he was known. Who was a, a British Foreign Secretary for like 20 years. The, 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 uh, one of, if not the longest, tenure in that job that any one person has ever had at the turn of the, at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, and he wrote uh, 25 years. He wrote a, a two volume memoir of his life that is really, really good. And I have it in the biography shelf. We've seen it uh, on this channel. And he also wrote Falloden papers, just a collection of miscellaneous stuff, including speeches and addresses that he would give to rotary clubs or women's groups or book clubs or that sort of thing, including quite a bit of bookish stuff. Uh, and he also wrote a fishing book about fly fishing because he had he had estates and he used to fly fish on his estates and the estates of his friends. But he also wrote something else, and I I can't believe I found it. Brad, it's called The Charm of Birds, and it's just this lovely little book uh, with uh, woodcuts by Robert Gibbons. Let me show you one of these. The woodcuts are absolutely lovely. Uh, there there are some of them had the each chapter, and then some of them have their own page. That is quite nice. And this is just, this is just uh, Lord Grey writing about birds. <laughs> Go, he goes through a year in this book and and writes about the birds uh, at Falodon and elsewhere, what they're like, what it's like to listen to them, uh, what their behavior can be observed to be. Grey is famous, uh, most famous, I imagine today. And he's not very famous at all, but he, he's most famous at all uh, today because. And on the eve of, of uh, World War, of the World War, he was the one who had that famous quote: uh, "The lights are going out all over Europe, and we don't know when they'll be lit again. They may not be lit again in our lifetime." That that ca he captured the the feeling of the moment by saying that, and uh, put a, a long stamp on on his government for the time that he was in office and a long after that. I was also friends with Theodore Roosevelt, of course, and they they spent time out of doors. Uh, I. Owning a copy of this book never occurred to me. It just It's just a, a testament to the wonder of the Brattle Bookshop that something like this will show up. Well, will show up uh, there for a dollar. That You never know. This is, uh, this is the 1938 edition, right? This is, uh, this is not a reprint. This thing was never reprinted. 1927. Yeah, this is it was just out there in the sale lot. I, and uh, that's fantastic to me. Same thing with this next one. This next one I've had, I had it in a mass market. Uh, a long, long time ago. Really, really liked it. And I knew that I would encounter it again someday. It's World War II history, but I, I'll take that any day. This is Imperial Tragedy by Thomas Coffey. All about the rise, the fall of uh, the Japanese Empire in World War II. Coffey was a veteran newspaper man, so once again, he knows how to tell a story. He knows what to do. This is the, uh, the, the Pacific Theater and the Japanese counterpart to The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich by William Shire, and now the journalist. And every bit is good. Boy, oh boy. Just, this is just a terrific book. Very happy to see it for a dollar for, for our hardcover. It's a little, there's a little bit of wearing on top there, but I will, uh, I will see what, what I can do about that and may even reread this by the end of the year. We're, gonna, we're approaching a period where I'm going to be doing a lot more rereading than new book reading in 2020. So I, I don't know that, that Imperial Tragedy is a keeper in the sense of coming into this room, but it's definitely a keeper in the sense of going with my other World War II biographies. Uh, but in terms of a keeper coming in this room, well, I knew that I would find it. I didn't know that it would be so soon. We saw this on our Daily Penguin, Natural History of Selburn by Gilbert White. And at the time I said there was an illustrated version out there that I really wanted. Well, here you go. <laughs> this, is, this is done in collaboration with the Gilbert White Museum. And this is full of uh, his journals. His, his there's a bat. <laughs> this is full of of his letters and his disquisitions to other naturalists. But it's also full of uh, color depictions done by those other naturalists. So contemporary drawings of a lot of the creatures that are mentioned on and off in the course of these these letters and ruminations. So I'm, uh, the reason I, that I grabbed this and the reason I mentioned it is because I showed you my Penguin Classic. I have just an ordinary Penguin Classic paperback of this. And I remember saying uh, that one of the uses that I like to put my Penguin Classics to is as backups. So I have a wall of the, of the basics. But the basics on that wall that I truly love, I'm also going to want a really nice 
reading edition of them, something that's a little bit more uh, elaborate than a Penguin Classic. Have that with a bunch of things. Have that with a, with a bunch of, uh, from Homer all to Seven Pills of Wisdom to uh, uh, Gravity's Rainbow to a bunch of other things. Uh, the Education of Henry Adams, you name it. Most of the books in this room on the non-Penguin walls are also represented on the Penguin Wall. And here's, this is another example. This is certainly coming in here, but only after a, a sizable rereading. <laughs> uh, and then we have a, a couple of biographies, of course. You can't have a trip to the Brattle without biographies. This, uh, this first one is uh, something that I read and reviewed when it came out in 2019. It's Kate Hubbard's biography of Bess of Hardwick uh, that ranges further into, it's not just a biography of Bess of Hardwick, as no biography of Bess of Hardwick is. It's also uh, an inquiry into uh, the world of Elizabethan England and the, the world reflected in Bess's life. And I have another, I have a hundred year old biography of Bess of Hardwick, but uh, I had this as well. I got the advanced copy. I got the finished copy. I reviewed it, uh, but I got rid of it. This may in fact be my copy. Actually, let's, let's take a look and see. No. All right. Well, this isn't, this isn't my copy, but uh, it might as well be because I, this, this, I had a copy of this once upon a time. And for some reason I got rid of it, even though it's much better done than that hundred year old version. So uh, Kate Harvard is a terrific, terrific writer. So happy to find it again at the Brattle for a dollar. I'll take it. Absolutely. Uh, and then uh, the last thing here is, a, it's odd. It's not quite a biography as its author. Uh, assures you right at the beginning. It's not quite a biography. It's more like an appreciation slash history slash memoir. Uh, I was happy to find it. I don't, I don't, it doesn't have a dust jacket, but that's all right. Uh, it's The King's Grace by John Bucket. And it, it's, it's this thing. It's got dates on the bottom there, 1910 to 1935. And it is uh, a study in its own way of King George V. And I, I don't think I've ever read this. Uh, and I, I was fascinated right away. Buckin's a great writer. He's terrific to read on the page. Uh, and I have a little bit of disdain for George V. I think he's a kind of silly king. I mean, he's, he doesn't strike a very noble figure. I don't understand why any British monarch would ever take George as a name. I really don't. Uh, but he did, and so did his successor. And they were both in world wars. Uh, but as a weird kind of meditation on the history of these years by this author. I don't think I've ever read this. I've read a lot of Bucket. So for a dollar, I'll gladly, I'll gladly experiment. So there you have it. We have a, a few things that I've never read that I want to read. A few things that I have read many times and I'd like the editions or whatever. We have The King's Grace. Uh, we have Devices and Desires, a biography of uh, Bess of Hardwick, of Hardwick Hall. We have Natural History of Selborne, only in the, a nice illustrated version that'll come into this room. We have Imperial Tragedy about uh, the the uh, Empire of Japan during World War II. We have The Charm of Birds by Gray of Falodon, which means that I have now a large number of Falodon books. <laughs> so, uh, then we have uh, Bookman's Progress uh, by an indefatigable library fan. We have The Making of the President, 1960 by Theodore White. We have Day Over, A Night Over Day Overnight, uh, Paul Watkins' stunning debut novel. Uh, we have David Copperfield by some guy named Charles Dickens. Uh, and finally, we have the king, the death of the king, by P.C. Doherty, about what really killed King Edward II, and uh, and not the mythology that sprang up around his death immediately afterwards, and that is largely what's known today. Very interesting stuff. A nice mix here of things that I have read and things that I haven't read, things that I haven't read in a long time and want to reread, that sort of thing, uh, which will stand me in good stead in December. So it was a good trip to the Brattle. <laughs> I don't know. I probably won't go back to the Brattle or that post office again for another week, but when I do, you'll be the first to know. <laughs> so I'll wrap this up for now, uh, but I will see you soon. Thank you, BookTube.